morning. It's good to see you at Sweetwater this morning. We're excited about what God is going to do. I'm going to tell you, I, I'm, I'm already excited coming in here today. Now, lay it on me today for the choir being late, getting in here just a, a, a few minutes late today. I look down at my watch while I am teaching from Romans 8 over there next door, and it was 1025. And I said, uh, we're done, go. Uh, and I literally jogged over here. Uh, but anyway, man, I'm going to tell you, if you're not in a Sunday school class, I just want to encourage you to get in one. Uh, man, we, we have a great time. Because Romans 8 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. And, uh, and so, um, I, don't, I don't know. I told him, I said, I could go another 30 minutes and keep teaching and, and we'll just go home. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, just a wonderful morning, great start to this morning. Let me, let me uh, mention a couple quick things um, that I want to uh, make sure we're reminded of. Two weeks from today, Brother Gary Boland will be here with us uh, for a Super Sunday. Brother Gary is one of our favorite evangelists. Uh, he will be here two weeks from today, so I encourage you to be here for both of those services. Also, uh, our Men and Boys Night on April the 25th, starting at 6.30, we're going to eat. And then uh, we're going to be blessed to come in together for worship. Uh, Brother Dick DeBusk is going to be preaching. And then uh, Brother Donald Rudd will be leading the worship. So we're excited about that on the 25th. We'll have a sign-up sheet out there for you guys. And also we're encouraging other churches to come and be a part of that. And then, of course, uh, September 25th through the 28th is a date I hope and pray you've already got on your calendar four nights. Four nights of crusade that's going to be, that we're joining together with other churches, it's going to be out at the Jackson Parish uh, Recreational Facility. Brother Bill Britt will be preaching. It's going to be a tent meeting, and uh, he's going to be preaching, and we are called, is going to be leading the worship. So it's going to be a tremendous time. That's September the 25th through the 28th, that Sunday morning. Brother Bill Britt will be with us. He will be preaching here at 9 o'clock that Sunday morning. There will be no Sunday school that morning uh, because he's going to preach here at 9 and then he's going to preach at McDonald Memorial at 11. And so uh, there will be no Sunday school that morning, but he'll be preaching in our services that, that morning. We'll be reminding you of that. I also want to make a quick reminder of the skeet shoot that's coming up on August the 20th. And shooting will start at 3 o'clock. And then at 530, there's going to be burgers to eat. It's a $10 entry fee. It's going to be at Jonathan and Kelly Futrell's home. Uh, bring your shotgun shells and a lawn chair. Skeet will be provided. Brother Ken Roberts will be the speaker. He's the pastor at Carolina Baptist Church. And so uh, just wonderful things that are happening. Uh, but today's the Lord's Day. And uh, wonderful things are happening today. Amen. And so we're excited about what God's going to do here this morning. Let's pray, and then Brother Larry's going to come and lead us. Father, thank you so much for the day that you've given us, the day to be able to come and to be able to worship you, to be able to, to sing to you, to be able to hear your word preached, Father. And I pray that all of us would respond the way that we need to today. Lord, may you get glory and praise out of everything that we do here today. In Jesus' name, amen. I told the pastor this, that when, he, when he made that statement about 25 after, he's still going. I said, well, maybe you got it out of your system in Sunday school. <laughs> So let's stand together, if you will. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Let's proclaim it. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the sea. Yeah. Hey. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the words that you have before us, and we have the ability to read and worship you, Lord. We just are so blessed for what we have, and like you say, with you, we shouldn't want anything if we already have you. 
what we feel is the rest of this service, Lord, and the words that Brother Wallace has for us to hear that you've given him, Lord, and please forgive us where we fail you and invite someone back tonight, Lord, and we just love and honor you and
Thank you, choir. As they come down, let's sing one of my favorite hymns. My Jesus, I love thee. Let's sing it the verse, verse. My Jesus, I love thee. I What a, uh, 
What a very special time we've already had in praise today. And I'm so grateful for the song the choir sang because that is a covenant decree that you and I need to enter into that we're going to be willing to say for the rest of our life that we're going to decree that we believe in Jesus and all that the Word of God says about Him, that we believe in Him, that we trust Him, and that we're going to share that Word with the world around us that so desperately needs to hear it. Paul has been dealing with uh, sin in the church at Corinth. The first six chapters that we've dealt with, we've not done a verse by verse, but we've, we've hit, I think, some of the highlights of his letter uh, to the Corinthians in dealing with the sin in the camp, the sin in the church. And now in chapter 7, he begins to deal with questions that the church at Corinth had sent to him. We know that there had been quite a bit of correspondence between Paul and the Corinthian church, and so he's going to deal with questions that they've asked him about, and, and he does, uh, especially with this first one, uh, a tremendous amount of information that he shares with them. The first question that they asked him, or the first question that he deals with, deals with marriage. So today we're going to be dealing with the question about marriage. There are other questions that they asked him. Uh, they're going to ask him about uh, food being offered to idols, uh, whether to eat those foods, whether those foods are clean to eat and so forth. He's going to uh, deal with the question of spiritual gifts. They're going to ask him about spiritual gifts. I'm going to tell you something. This was a troubled church, but I am very grateful that they were willing to ask some questions. And so they asked him about the spiritual gifts, and we have chapters 12 through 14 that deal extensively with the spiritual gifts. They asked him about the resurrection, and he's going to deal with the resurrection in chapter 15. They asked him about the offering that was given, uh, that, that was being promoted to give to the Jews. They asked him, about that and he's going to deal with that as well but he's going to deal with marriage here in chapter 7 there's no doubt in my mind that most of the marital issues that the church at Corinth dealt with was based on the society in which they were living I would say that a lot of the things that are going on in our churches today whether it be in marriage whether it be in family uh, is impacted by the society in which we live today. They were corrupted by the society in which they live. The society in which they live tolerated many things that we find being tolerated in our society today. The Corinthian society, the Greek society of that day, encouraged adultery. Not only did they encourage adultery, they encouraged fornication. That is any sex type outside of marriage, and in particular, you might say premarital sex, adultery being extramarital sex, the society in which they live encouraged that. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then, not only did they encourage that, but they encouraged homosexuality. They encouraged that lifestyle. They encouraged polygamy. Now, I said all of these things sort of sound like our society, maybe with the exception of polygamy, but we know that that's still a part of what's being practiced in other parts of the world and even some sectors of our own nation. John MacArthur shares about a Roman poet who wrote during the time of A.D. 60 to 140. This Roman poet wrote a poem about women. He wrote a poem about women that, who rejected their own sex. He wrote a poem that said this, that women rejected their own sex. They wore helmets. They delighted in feats of strength. And they, with exposed breasts, hunted after pigs with spears. Now you say, well, why would we share that today? Because we live in a society that is doing the same thing today. Even though that kind of language coming from a Roman poet in that day 
we live in a day where men and women are rejecting their own sex. Where we live in a day where, where we're even having the discussion about whether or not we're going to have children to be exposed to the transsexual lifestyle in school. Where they're going to be taught about that and other lifestyles that are similar. So we live in the same kind of society in which they lived in the day of Corinth. We are told that in the days of Corinth that, that literally women would wear out their wedding dresses because they would use them so many times. It was not unusual for someone to be married as many as 20 times in the society of Corinth. I want you to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want you to see Paul writing with that backdrop. You know it had to be very frustrating to him and and it was, it was very difficult for him in, in, in ministering in these times. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we honor the Word of God. And I'm going to read through verse 24. Now you say, that's a lot of reading. Well, I'm going to read through verse 24. And I'll just tell you that tonight, if you come back tonight, that I'm going to ask you to stand for the entire sermon that I preached tonight. I'm just kidding. There, there wouldn't be very many people here. But guess what? In Nehemiah's day... When Ezra spoke, when Ezra spoke and they had a great worship service after the rebuilding of the walls, we believe that he probably spoke for at least five or six hours and they stood the entire time that the Word of God was read and the Word of God was preached. I won't do that to you, but we're going to stand for these verses, okay? Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body. I didn't say that. God did. The husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a, and a husband is not to divorce his wife, but to rest but to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let, her, let him not divorce her. Now, the reason why Paul said that is because Jesus had not addressed that issue. And so now he has revelation that's coming from the Lord in dealing with this particular issue of an unbeliever, being married to an unbeliever. Look at verse 13. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, and otherwise, otherwise your children will be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife. But as God has distributed to each one as well, the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while, I, while circumcised? Let him not, be uncir not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commands of God is what matters. That each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. 
For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. You may be seated. Wow. This is a difficult passage of Scripture. <laughs> and uh, so you pray as we walk through this together. It's difficult, but it's clear, I think, in so many ways what Paul is saying. Under the Roman law, there were four types of marriages. Four types of marriages under Roman law, and likely the folks at Corinth were living under these laws. So you had these four groups of people that were in the church at Corinth. The first one is, these are Latin terms, and so don't worry about being able to spell them, but I'll tell you what they mean. Cont contubernium. Contubernium. By the way, I've practiced these, and I'll mess them up, and you won't know it, though. Contubernium. That's, the, that's, that's one of the types of marriages in the day of, of Corinth. This is where men and women who were slaves were married. Now, these men and women who were slaves, they had an arrangement that had been made by the slave owner, and at any time, he could break up the marriage. So slaves could be married. As long as the owner allowed, he could then separate them or sell them to another. That's one. A second one is usus, and that means common law marriage, where if they were married for a year, then it would become recognized as married. In other words, excuse me, if they had lived together, if they lived together for a year, then after a year, it would be known as being fully married. So they, what, were they, what were they promoting? They were promoting out-of-sex marriage. They were promoting that if you just live together, then after a year, then you become married. Co competition manum. What is this? Here's the third group. That the father could sell his daughter to a prospective husband. He could literally sell his daughter. Again, the three, these three groups that we mentioned, likely in the church at Corinth. No wonder they have questions about marriage, huh? No wonder Paul's got some issues to deal with. The, the last one is conferiato which is the noble class in the day. And, and both families participated, and they arranged the marriages. Um, we, we don't have a whole lot of understanding about that, but it still happens in the world today. Lots of places in the world where mamas and daddies arrange the marriages of their children. Now, what they would literally do in this day, both families participated. They arranged the marriage. They had a, a, maid of, excuse me, a matron of honor. They would have a best man. They exchanged vows, and they had rings in their ceremony. Sounds like, again, where we got some of our practices as far as wedding ceremonies. But it was not impossible. It was not impossible in that day for someone to be married, divorced, and remarried 20-some-odd times in that day. Now, that's kind of crazy sounding to us, isn't it? But this is, this is the condition of the church where Paul was writing this about marriage. And so the early church, not only in Corinth, the early church had people that were living in these types of marriages is because this is what happened in the Roman Empire. And so some of them got the idea that it was better for believers to be celibate or to be single, and that that would mean that they were more spiritual. So that's one of the issues that Paul's having to deal with. In fact, you know, you kind of think about that response on their part, kind of understand it a little bit, can't you? They're thinking, man, I don't want to go through this type, these types of marriages and, and, and so forth. Instead, they say, well, we'll just be single. But their thought was, if I remain single, that means I'm more spiritual. And Paul is going to address that issue as well. So here are some of their questions. And boy, as I, as I read this, I, I just kept saying, man, Lord, you got to help me because this, uh, there's no way to be able to deal with all of this in, in this setting today. But, but we're going to hit the highlights. Here are some of their questions. Should we remain married if we're both believers? That was one of their questions. Should we remain married if we're both believers? Another question they had is, should we get divorced if our spouse is an unbeliever? Should we just automatically, because we're saved, we got saved, they're lost, should we just automatically 
um, be divorced? Or should we just remain single? Those are the three questions that are really at stake. And so he has a word for each one of these groups. Here's the first word. He has a word for those who are married to believers. So you put yourself in one of these situations probably. Word to those who are married to believers. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is not a complete theology of marriage. If you want a complete theology of marriage, you've got to start at Genesis and go all the way through. To get a complete understanding of what the biblical view of marriage is. Some literal uh, uh, critics today um, of, of Paul, uh, li excuse me, liberal critics, have accused Paul of being anti-marriage and they've accused him of being anti-women because of this, this type of writing. Now, we know that that's not true. In fact, I want to say that I think it's very, very possible, very likely, that Paul had been married. I think that Paul was probably a widower. The reason why I think that is because Paul was a devout Pharisee, wasn't he? And in order to be a devout Pharisee, almost all of them were married. And he considered them, himself to be the devout of devout devout. So likely, I think, you know, listen, we don't have proof, but likely I think that Paul had probably been married and he was a widower and he's saying here, in my situation, he said it's better now for me to remain single that I can remain focused on the ministry that God has for me. But he's not saying that that's the right thing for everybody. Okay? And, and so... Um, I, I think it, it's foolish for people to think that he was anti-women or anti-marriage. Uh, Paul will establish in this chapter that marriage is the norm. Marriage is the norm, but singleness is a special gift from God, and it is good. So there are those maybe that back in that day thought there was not the right thing to be single, that it was not a good thing. He said... That marriage is normal and so is being single and both of them are blessed of God and both of them come as a result of a gift from God. So Paul is going to establish here some certain things about marriage. Here's, here's one. Marriage is always to be monogamous, not polygamous. Marriage is to be monogamous. In other words, Paul refers to a husband and his wife, not wives. Husband and wife. Listen, folks, that's always been God's plan. Do you hear me? That's always been God's plan. Well, what about some of those guys in the Old Testament? Listen, they weren't perfect. They made wrong decisions. They got away from God's ideal. They got away from God's will. It's always been that way that God desires for a husband and a wife that they would be monogamous. Paul's teachings are based on the teachings of Jesus, based upon what's said in Genesis chapter 2. Look, look back real quick. Just want you to see it. Go to Genesis chapter 2 and look at verse 24. Just from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wives and they shall become one flesh. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's not what it said. If your Bible says that, you need to get another Bible. It says here that it be joined to his wife. This is a monogamous relationship that, that the Bible teaches. And Jesus reaffirmed that in Matthew chapter 19. And so you just go back and you see that. But the second thing is that marriage is between a man and a woman. So marriage is to be monogamous. The second thing is that marriage is between a man and a woman. The sexual relationship is only blessed, now listen, is only blessed between a biological man and a biological woman within the blessed confines of marriage. Anything, listen to me, anything outside of that 
no matter what you want to think is not biblical. I think as believers, we have to choose to live according to a biblical view of the world. A biblical view of marriage. And the biblical view is sexual relationship blessed between a biological man and woman in the confines of marriage. So sexual expression is blessed within the intimacy of marriage. Any sexual relation outside of heterosexual, monogamous marriage relationship is a corruption of God's perfect design. It's something that we have to get so, so specific today. But you know what? It's not me getting specific. The Word of God is specific about it. Just very clear about that which God blesses, that that which honors God. And, And so... In marriage, he says here something that kind of takes us back a little bit when we read it. It says, and to the woman, your body does not belong to you. And to the man, yet your body does not belong to you, but you belong to one another. Husbands and wives, in other words, are, he goes on to say, are to strive. To meet each other's physical and emotional needs for intimacy. He said, in other words, my desire ought to be to meet the needs of my wife, and my wife's desire needs to be to meet the needs of the husband. But we we know that not just in the realm of the sexual, but also in other realms of our life, it's not always the case, is it? That sometimes that we're about self, and that's, that's when we're living according to the flesh, that we're living according to self versus what God's Word has to say. And, and so, so we, uh, uh, in, in a marriage relationship, ought to be in every way trying to meet the needs of our spouse above our own needs. Now listen to me. Look at verse, uh, just look at verse 3 through 5 again. That the husband render to his wife affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. So listen, there's mutual submission here. Nobody is domineering over another in a biblical marriage relationship. There's nobody that is dominant over the other. And then it says, uh, when it comes to the physical realm, that, that you can take time, he says here, for prayer and fasting. In other words, that there'll be a fasting from a sexual relationship within marriage for the purpose of spending time in prayer. And I would say that it would be a really good thing that when that's mutually decided, that you do so to pray for your own marriage. Hello? That you spend time praying over your own marriage and you spend time praying over your family. Now listen, to not practice marriage this way brings dishonor to God because it dishonors marriage. When you dishonor the, the, the institution of marriage, you're dishonoring God. Here's another thing. Marriage is a lifetime commitment. Marriage is a lifetime commitment. Today, we know that there are as many divorces as what there are marriages. 50% of those who marry divorce. And the sad part about this is it's not that different in the church. It's not that much difference from those that raised up in the church, know the Lord, 60% 60% of second marriages, you've heard this statistic before, 60% of second marriages, as much as 75% of third marriages in, in divorce. Now here, here's one of the vitally important things that we need to realize when you're thinking about getting married. That you are, as a believer, not to marry an unbeliever. Come on. You are not to marry an unbeliever. If you're a believer, you're not to go out and marry an unbeliever. In fact, if if you're not going to marry an unbeliever, then you don't need to be dating unbelievers. In fact, I'm going to say this. You don't need to be dating somebody who's not a strong believer. 
The Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked. That's, that's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 39. Look down at verse 39. It says, a wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only, here it stipulates, in the Lord. <laughs> you marry anybody you feel led to marry as long as they're saved folks. That's what it says over in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. It says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord does Christ have with the devil and what part has the believer with an unbeliever? So why would we do that? We know, we know that we're just asking for problems, aren't we? When a believer, somebody that knows the Lord, that goes out and dates an unbeliever or then marries an unbeliever. Now here, here, let me go to the next part of this and, I said that marriage is a lifetime commitment. So what does God think about divorce? What does God think about divorce? Well, I can tell you very quickly, Malachi 2.16. Doesn't say too many times in Scripture too many things that God hates, but it says it there. It says that Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. Now, let me be clear that God does not hate the divorcee. Amen? God does not hate the divorcee, but he hates divorce. Why? I can tell you why. One of the reasons I think is because of the pain that it causes the one that he loves. <laughs> divorce is painful. Some of the most intense pain a person can ever experience. Is it no wonder that God, who loves us, says that he hates divorce? He hates what it does to those folks that are involved in it intimately as husband and wife. He hates what it does to kids. He hates what divorce does to children. If you're the child, if, you're, if your parents divorced you, you can identify. You can, you can say, I know that there, there, there's pain and there's suffering that comes along what, with that. What it, he, he not only hates it because of that, but he hates it because of what it does to society. And he hates it because it is against his plan for mankind. God knows what's right. God knows what's best. And he's against it because of what it does to mankind. So a second thing that it says of what he thinks about divorce, it is contrary to his will. It is against his will. You say, well, you don't know because you haven't been in my situation. I can just tell you this. I can tell you this, that divorce, no matter what it is, is against God's ideal will for us. It is. God did not set this thing up and say, I, 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 I want you to get married and then get divorced. It, it, it's, it's not God's plan. It is contrary to his will. Now I'm going to go further. I'm going to make some of you mad. It is a sin. Divorce is a sin. Because it is against God's ideal plan for us. And God's ideal plan for society. It is a sin, but thank God, it is a forgivable sin. I want you to know, for all of us, when it comes to divorce, I want you to understand that divorce is not the unforgivable sin. Sometimes I think maybe it's been treated that way, and maybe in the past, but, but divorce is forgivable. Also, Jesus allows a biblical concession for divorce. He allows a biblical concession for divorce, and it's found in Matthew chapter 19, and it is unfaithfulness. Now listen to me. That doesn't mean just because somebody's been unfaithful does not mean you have to divorce. There can be repentance, there can be restoration, there can be change, there can be the uniting together again. That's the power of God and what he's able to do. 
But he allows for the concession of divorce. When there is no repentance, there can be restoration. Let me tell you something. As a believer, divorce should be our last resort. We should go through everything possible to save the marriage. It's a last resort. Now, what were some of the reasons why the Corinthians would be wanting a divorce? They thought, some of them thought they could live holier lives by being single. And then some wanted to marry somebody else because somebody else they thought was more desirable. They want somebody else. If a Christian divorces another Christian except for adultery, to remarry is a sin. If you have done this, confession and repentance is needed. I pray if you've done this, you've already done that. You have confessed your sinfulness. And no matter what we may want to think, divorce is caused by two people, not one. It may be 90% one, 10% the other. Some of you say, you don't know what I had to deal with. It may be 99% one person, 1% the other, but it always involves two people. And it is always a sin. And it needs to be confessed to God and repented of. And restoration, though, is promised in our lives. He will restore us. Divorce and remarriage is not the unforgivable sin because, listen to me, we thank God today for grace. <laughs> Amen? We thank God today for grace. Then here's a word to believers who are married to unbelievers. Believers who are married to unbelievers. Jesus had not discussed this. So Paul is saying here, I have divine revelation on the subject. How do I know it's divine revelation? Because the whole word of God is inspired. Hello? Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. This is all inspired. I also know that God took Paul out to seminary training too. He revealed some things to him out there in his training, didn't he? And this is one of those things that he would reveal. The Corinthians thought that Christians would be defiled by an unbelieving spouse. I want to tell you that Paul says that the opposite is true. The opposite is true. The unbelieving spouse, listen to this, is sanctified by the believing spouse, Paul says. Now what in the world does that mean? It means that the, not that the unbeliever is saved by the believing spouse. But that unbeliever is set apart, sanctified, as being one who is privileged to live with a believer. That unbeliever in the marriage is privileged to be able to live with the believer. Why? Because that unbeliever is going to be prayed for. That unbeliever is going to be witnessed to by word and by testimony. So they are sanctified, they are set apart, they are privileged. The unsaved person is. The home with a believing spouse is superior to one that is without a believing spouse. It is a superior home environment. The unbelievers, if you're the unbeliever, only believer in your home, the only believer in your marriage, then your home and your marriage is blessed by you, the fact that you are a believer in the home. Often, the means whereby a saved husband and a lost wife, that lost wife gets saved many times as a result of the saved husband. Vice versa, that the saved wife so influences and prays for maybe for many, many years till finally to that husband gets saved. Or maybe it is you're that child that's in the home and you're the only child in that home, the only person in that home that's saved. That home is sanctified. That home is set apart as being privileged because you are in that home living for Jesus. And others get saved. Some of you can testify that you've been able to lead your parents to the Lord or, 
or your spouse to the Lord. Now, if an unbelieving spouse, according to what Paul says, if an unbelieving spouse is willing to stay married, the believer is not to seek a divorce. If the unbelieving spouse is willing to stay, the believer is not to seek a divorce. If the unbeliever is determined to leave the marriage, listen, if the unbeliever is determined to leave the marriage, the believer has no control over that outcome and is not under bondage. It's what the scripture says. In God's eyes, the only acceptable reasons to dissolve a marriage is death, adultery, or an unbeliever leaving. That is the only biblical acceptance for divorce. Now, certainly, there are other extreme things that go on. And certainly, we make mistakes, don't we? In even deciding, perhaps, to have a divorce. That's where God's grace and God's forgiveness comes into play. To give you forgiveness and a fresh opportunity and a fresh start. A new start. Amen. And then one more thing. There's a word to the single. He gives a lot of words to the single here, especially the first part of the chapter. Here, here's for those of you that are single. A single life requires celibacy. The single life requires celibacy. What is celibacy? Sexually abstinent. Why? Because the only acceptable means of sexual expression is within the confines of marriage. So he says that celibacy is good. He says to touch a woman in that first part, that first verse, is good for a man not to touch a woman. Man, you go, whoa, wow, Paul. But what, is that, what does that mean? Would, as, as, a, as a single person, that means the expression of sexual intercourse. That's what that means. To touch a woman means sexual intercourse. Paul's saying it is a good thing to be single as long as you're sexually abstinent. That it's good. And it's not a more spiritual state. They were saying, well, we're more spiritual because we're not married. We... Uh, we used to be married and we're not going to marry again or we've never been married and, and we, we're more we're faith, faithful to the Lord we're more of what God wants us to be that is not what Paul said it is not a more spiritual state than those who are married celibacy also is tempting he says it's tempting Paul speaks of the danger of sexual immorality for those who are single he stresses the reality of sexual temptation for singles and that they have a legitimate outlet in marriage. He said, rather be better for you to marry than to burn with passion. And then get involved in things that are not God's will. And here's the good thing for single folks. God is able to help you deal with temptation. He enables you to be able to say no to temptation. And I'm, I'm going to say this. If somebody is trying to force you into having a sexual relationship with them outside of marriage, run from them. You hear me? Get away from that. They don't love you. They love themselves. They don't love you. There are biblical reasons for getting married. Procreation. Pleasure. 
partnership, the picture of Christ in the church, protection from sexual immorality, all those things are reasons to get married. And then celibacy can be a gift to serve God without hindrance. It could be a gift to serve God without hindrance. If, if believers are right with God, and it is His will for them to marry, listen, He will send the right person at the right time. Can I say that one more time? Because y'all were putting your stuff up. <laughs> I know, I, I, it's like right there, boom, I lost you. You say, he's through with the outline. Let's, get, let's go, let's go. If believers are right with God and it is his will for them to marry, he will send the right person at the right time. So what is Paul stressing here? Man, I, there's no way to preach all this stuff. Paul stresses the seriousness of marriage. God takes marriage seriously. We cannot disobey God's word without suffering the consequences. If we deliberately are disobeying God's word, we will deal with the consequences. And what's he saying? Every marriage, every single effort should be made to save a marriage. Now, so when you're considering marriage, ask this. What is my gift from God? Is my gift from God to be married? My gift from God to be single? Am I gifted with biblical singleness? You need to ask those questions. Here's another question you need to ask. Am I dating or marrying, engaged to a strong believer? Here's another one. How will my marriage affect my service to the Lord? How is your marriage affecting your service to the Lord? Does it need to be worked on? Does it need to be improved upon? And here, before you get married, here, here's a biggie that you better be able to ask your, answer this question. Am I prepared to live with this person for the rest of my life? Some of you, some of you looking, y'all thinking, we'll just look at each other, right? And I want you, I almost want you married people to just look at each other and say, can you, are you going to make it? And you say, well, I didn't think about that. I always ask, are you, do you think, are you willing to make the commitment that you're going to be sitting there on your front porch, rocking on your front porch when you've been married 50, 60 years and 80, 90 years old, and you're holding hands together, and you're just enjoying life together. <coughs> it's a lifetime commitment, folks. I want you to bow your heads. This is a tough message to preach. It's a tough message to hear. We're going to begin to play here in just a moment when our instrumentals get here, but I, I, I'm going to ask some questions here of you. I, I don't want anybody walking out. I, if you can help it, I don't want anybody uh, talking, looking around. This, time, this is time for us to do some real reflection. Today, if, if you are married, Will you renew your commitment to God and to your spouse right now? If you've gone through divorce, have you confessed it as sin against God's ideal and repented of your failure in marriage. If not, today's the day to do that. If 
if you are married, is, is, is your spouse's needs being placed above your own? focused on them than yourself. If not, we need to repent. We can repent today and move forward seeking God's will for our lives. Have you forgiven? If you've gone through a divorce, have you forgiven the person that hurt you? Or have you asked forgiveness of the person that you hurt? To be right with God, we must extend forgiveness and seek forgiveness. If you're single, are you committed to being sexually pure until the time in which you are married? or for the rest of your life as a single Christian. You can make that commitment today. If you failed in any of these areas that we've talked about today, you can repent today. possibly be the husband or wife that I need to be now or that I need to be in the future because I've never been saved. Some of you need to come to this altar and you need to spend some time with God at the altar. You say, well, you know what? If I go to the altar, that means everybody's going to know I'm guilty of something. Well, guess what? We're all guilty of something. God, we need to get it right, make some fresh commitments today, and walk out of here rejoicing, thanking God for the spouse that God's given to us if you're married, Father, I give this to you, I try my best, Lord, to do what you want me to do today, and I just know it's your word, Father. Pray that uh, we would respond the way we need to, in whatever way that is, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together. Brother Larry, would you lead us?